New York is alone among 32 states in saying no right now. We, we are in a period of, uh, of pushing the pause button. We've declared a sort of de facto temporary moratorium while we await um, the release of a document called the um, SGEIS, which is the Supplemental Generic Environmental Impact Statement, uh, which a lot of us feel is an inadequate look at the risks that hydrofracking poses to us because it did not take into account cumulative impacts. So it only looks at one gas well at a time. Um, 77,000 gas wells are envisioned for upstate New York. And of course, the accumulation of all the air pollution and all the water pollution is what biologically we'll experience, not just uh, one uh, well uh, at a time. So one of, uh, uh, one of the criticisms that a lot of us have directed toward um, uh, the Cuomo administration is, look, we need to look at cumulative impacts. It also doesn't take health, human health into account at all in its current incarnation. And so we've also asked um, that we should look at human health impacts. Um, and so uh, the administration, to its credit, is taking those seriously. So we are now in a process where all of the commentary that many of us wrote saying, here is how this environmental impact statement is inadequate, those are now being carefully read. Um, and there will be no permits and no hi uh, horizontal hydrofracking permitted until this document uh, is released. Um, so that's kind of the status of where we're at now. And I have to tell you, the whole world is watching New York. That we, we who live in the southern tier of New York are at the bullseye. We're in the crosshairs of the world's largest uh, companies, Exxon, Halliburton, Chesapeake, um, who all have our eyes on us. But we've said no right now for a little while at least. Um, and meanwhile, um, fracking is going on like gangbusters uh, south of us in Pennsylvania. Uh, and has, uh, uh, American companies have moved into Europe and to South Africa and places around the world. And as I've traveled around the world, I get a lot of questions about what's going on in New York. Why has New York said no? And what does it mean for the rest of the world right now? Um, so that I got a lot of questions when I was in the European Parliament about our situation. Um, that were, I think, um, caused the press to look more closely at the problems with fracking, so that now um, you've seen that France has to, uh, on the brink of saying a permanent no to fracking because it's too great of a risk to public health. Uh, South Africa has turned its back on uh, fracking and said no. Quebec has also said no. And a lot of the uh, inspiration for doing that came from objections that we raised right here. So if you wanted to ever feel like you were born in a time where something really exciting and important that was transformative was going on, you are. And if you ever wanted a chance to be a hero, now's your chance. You know, I'd like to think if I were born in 1830s, I would have been an abolitionist. I would have insisted that even though at that time our economy was entirely bound up with slavery, we couldn't be competitive on the world market without slave labor. So many families had their entire wealth bound up in slaves that would be, and all that wealth would disappear if we declared uh, uh, slavery, you know, by constitutional amendment to be wrong and therefore can't exist anymore. And yet, nevertheless, it was a homicidal abomination and, it, and a lot of people in the 1830s Abolitionists were arguing it had to stop. One of them was Harriet Tubman, who lives right here in, in Auburn. And of course, New, York's, New Yorkers played a really big role in the Underground Railroad and in that whole movement. And I would like to think if I lived in the 1830s, that's what I would have been doing. But I don't. I live now. And so we're on the brink of trying to decide, are we going to keep going with the fo fossil fuel extraction, no matter how toxic, no matter whether we lay waste to the land and industrialize all our farmland, or, or finally we're going to stop and say it's time to do something different and not do this 19th century thing of drilling hydrocarbons out of the ground and lighting them on fire to turn on the lights. Um, so I would like to think that at this point in time, I'm a kind of latter-day ab abolitionist. I'm a fracking abolitionist. Um, and I think that that's the role that New Yorkers can play right now not only do you save your own community, but you send a message to the whole world, which is on the brink of trying to decide whether it's going to say, permit or prohibit this uh, extreme form of energy extraction. So you'll be hearing a lot about the consequences for uh, health uh, in, the, in this wonderful panel this afternoon. So I won't um, dwell too much on those, but I do want to talk about water since this is this kind of amazing festival that's uh, focused on it. So here in this glass, 
is tap water from uh, Binghamton. And uh, where does it go after it leaves here? Well, it becomes part of the Susquehanna River, which uh, then flows into the Chesapeake Bay. So you are connected to the blue crabs of the Chesapeake through this water. And so when I drink it, the water that is uh, part of the watershed of uh, upstate New York is connected to the river outside of the windows here in this wonderful hotel. And, uh, and this connects me all the way down to Baltimore. When I drink water from my own tap in uh, where I live, uh, I'm in a different watershed because uh, upstate New York has two huge watersheds and we're at the boundary between them. So when I drink water out of my tap in Trumansburg, New York, that water comes from an aquifer right next to Cayuga Lake. Uh, and I take a drink and I feed my children that water and it uh, then flows uh, through our sewage treatment plant, which is right before the Taganic Falls. <laughs> which is the highest waterfalls east of the Mississippi, and goes out um, a river of, uh, of north, um, on the north end of Cayuga Lake, joining the Otsego River uh, and um, Oswego River, uh, and the three river system that goes right into Lake Ontario. So my water from my kitchen tap joins me to the beluga whales of the St. Lawrence River and flows into the Atlantic through a different channel than this water. It flows into the Bay of Fundy, um, up by Newfoundland. So yours goes kind of down and out uh, through Maryland and, and my water goes up uh, into Canada. So when I uh, when I drink, well let me, t let me tell it as a story. Last month uh, I received some news that my, la my latest cancer checkup was not reassuring so they wanted me to come in and do more tests. And to do that test, I had to drink a quart of my own tap water um, and then get in the car and drive and hope that they're ready for me as soon as I get there, right? Um, because I, I needed to have an a full and expanded bladder to do the, uh, the ultrasound. So while I was drinking this quart of water from my kitchen tap, I began to think about how I hand my kids glasses of this water every day. The, all of our bodies are 69% water, so we have a more intimate relationship with the water cycle than any other part of our environment. And when my kids drink this water, it becomes their blood plasma. It becomes their cerebral spinal fluid. It becomes their tears. It becomes the exhale, their exhaled breath on a cold winter day. So I was thinking about all that while I was drinking the water. And then while lying down on the ultrasound table, I was trying to kind of meditate and not think too hard about all the things I felt anxious about, about my own health. And so I began to think about the water cycle, about my aquifer near Cayuga Lake, how it's called an unconfined aquifer, meaning that there's no lid on the top of it, right? Uh, and that makes it very vulnerable. So already in the water that I drink every day, I know from my water quality report, which um, my water utility is required to send me out on a quarterly basis, that my drinking water already contains 39 parts per billion nitrogen, which is almost uh, certainly uh, comes to us from anhydrous ammonia fertilizer, which is placed on the farm fields surrounding my village. And ammonia, by the way, is, uh, its starting point is natural gas. That's how you make petrochemical fertilizer. You start with natural gas. So 39 parts per billion isn't great, but it's not against the law. It's within legal limits. Um, but it does show how vulnerable my water is, right? We, it shows us that through some unknown mechanism, through some unknown pathway, um, what we spread on the surface of the earth finds its way hundreds of feet down below our feet into these vo watery vaults that form our, our drinking water. So I thought about all that, and I thought about how right across the lake, a half mile from me, is a sewage outflow from uh, the village, another village called uh, Cayuga Heights. And uh, that village in the year 2000 accepted frac fluid from Pennsylvania, which was dumped uh, into the lake, only a half mile from where we go swimming, from where my aquifer is located, and so forth. And I didn't, I didn't learn about that until this year when I read about it when I opened the New York Times. So things go on um, that affect me and my water in secret, and I don't know until some investigative reporter in the city of New York uh, does a study. So I thought about how uh, I'm joined um, in this of water that I drank with everything downstream 
from me um, and thought about what my obligations to this water were. So it occurred to me in that moment while I was lying there on the, on the ultrasound table that we're being asked to turn our precious New York water into poison. We're teach, we will be, we'll be forced to teach our teenage children to drive on icy roads full of fracking trucks. And meanwhile, I saw something on, uh, in Alaska that m makes me wonder what this is all about. So let, now let me tell you that story. Uh, in March, I went to Alaska and learned that, uh, and as you know, that there's a petroleum pipeline that goes from the north slope of Alaska down to Valdez. Um, there, there could it be a natural gas pipeline that parallels the petroleum pipeline because um, natural gas is often trapped with petroleum. It is the vaporous fraction of petroleum. And indeed, when they drill for oil in the north slope of Alaska, lots and lots of gas is liberated. Um, however, it's not profitable enough to build a pipeline and send it to market, so they just flare it off on the north slope of Alaska. Um, there's lots of it, so they flare a lot of it off, but it doesn't heat anybody's home, it doesn't make anything useful, it doesn't do anything. Um, and it was Sarah Palin's, actually, idea to build the natural gas pipeline, so it's not like a radical leftist notion to do that. Um, so why was it never built? Well, as I learned while I was there, it's because the price of natural gas is now so low because of all the fracking that we're doing in the east, the lower 48, especially on here on the east, um, that it has, it has brought the nat price of natural gas so low that it's not worth um, bringing it to market, so it simply flared off. So I began to look into this further, and I found out, I found out that natural gas is being flared almost everywhere that petroleum is being drilled, including Saudi Arabia, Iran, Iraq, uh, Russia, and Nigeria. Um, and basically, we're wasting the world's uh, natural gas production f from all petroleum sites, um, which is the equivalent of 125 coal plants, or could drive 77 million cars. Um, precisely because, uh, and I'll quote from a document here, very low natural gas prices have led to underinvestment in pipeline infrastructure. The policy distortions related to subsidized hydrocarbon pricing are behind it. So we're being asked to kind of lay ruin to our land um, and industrialize our farmland, threaten the water and uh, air that our children need, um, in order to bring bubbles of something out of the ground that in the north slope of Alaska is simply considered a waste product to, to be flared. And that, I guess, is what I realized uh, while lying on the ultrasound table, that, w that it just makes no sense. Um, and it's time to stop, start talking about the incoherencies of asking us to be, uh, you know, in the name of energy independence, to somehow uh, give up all the things that we, we hold dear um, to engage in this form of energy uh, extraction. Mm -hmm.